my name is Frank O'Connor. Uh, I'm Franchise Development Director at, in Halo at 343 Industries at Microsoft. The last couple of years or so, Call of Duty's pushed ahead with the eSports, but when Halo 2 Anniversary came back on the scene, Halo was back in a big way. Did you expect it to have that much of an impact? Uh, we, we hoped it, that the, the, the relaunch of Halo 2 and this sort of updated uh, Halo 2 anniversary form would have a big impact. And, and we knew it would be built on nostalgia, but I think the interesting thing we did with Certain Affinity was, was really modernize it based on what we thought, and we, I think we were right in the case of Halo 2 anniversary, what the Halo 2 fans from 2004 wanted to see in, in, in 2014. And I think that they really wanted to see an increase in fidelity, uh, an increase in fidelity of experience, but have a little bit of the same uh, type of gameplay that they'd enjoyed back in the day. Now, what we, what we knew was gonna happen immediately was that people were gonna start deferring to weapons that had become popular since, and, and that happened, and I think that's all right. Games evolve, and, and people are, frankly, a lot better at video games now than they used to be, and we, we see that even in the sort of repeated nostalgia in the Master Chief collection. We'll see people who used to be really good at Halo 2 are amazing at Halo 2 Anniversary, and they're better than they were then, but it's, in part because they're using some of the muscle memory and reflex that they build up over the last decade. The whole level playing field thing and, and the esports angle, is that the reason that Halo 5 was developed in the way that it was as well? Um, I think you have to be careful when, you, when you're developing a big AAA first person shooter. First off, 95% of our audience uh, is not a pro gaming audience. They're not ever going to be, you know, level 50 players. Um, so they need the game to be accessible, they need ramps to get into the game. The really hardcore pro skilled players also need the exact experience that they want. And I think if you try to I think if you try to bridge that gap with compromise, you make a terrible error. So we've we've taken a pretty different approach to that problem in Halo 5, which is we're making the games that we always make, these big spectacular sort of um, AAA console experiences. But we have uh, what we call the pro team, which unsurprisingly is a bunch of pro players, uh, current and, and past pro players. And what we're having them do is that last step, like how do we sharpen this blade so that it's, it's razor sharp? How do we hone this edge so that it's surgical steel rather than, than sword steel? And, and the, some of it is really subtle and that's fine because the 95% that I talked about, they're not necessarily gonna notice the difference between the, the sharpness of those, those final edges, uh, but, the, but the pro players will, and, and that's super important. So that, that's a way that we can uh, create an experience that's approachable by both audiences, but without compromising it for either, and that, that's been really important in the way that we've guided the development of that last inch of Halo 5. Would you say that the problems that the Master Chief Collection has had, and some would say it's caused kind of irreparable damage, like Battlefield did with that franchise, do you reckon that'll have a knock-on effect with the esports angle of Halo 5 and beyond, or is that repairable? You know, Halo, Halo Master Chief Collection is definitely a black eye for us. We, we, we don't, we're not going to. Uh we're not going to rest our laurels or hide from the mistakes that we made. However, I will say that the, the nature of Master Chief Collection, you've got five different game engines, you've got five different different studios working on it, we've got 343 working on putting it all together. The, the footprint of complexity was outrageous and, and to be perfectly honest, there were a lot of things that happened when we got in a retail environment that we simply didn't see in the test environment. So that, that that's really what caught us by surprise, so we've been sort of scrambling to, to get it first in a playable stage and, and now we're going into the get it in a polished stage so that people are getting the thing they deserved in the first place. We're never going to back away from that or shy away from that. However, Halo 5 is being made by a completely different team. It's a singular product. It was built from the ground up for this new technology rather than being sort of dragged kicking and screaming from 2001 and forced uh, and shoehorned in a, a 2014 console. Uh, so the problem spaces are still very challenging, but they're radically different. I think the beta is already a decent first step in a retail environment of showing that we don't have the same problems. Um, but the good thing about Master Chief Collection is A, that it's going to be fixed and working perfectly for most people, uh, but B, there are some learnings that we've been able to take from it, just in terms of how we think about uh, certain nuances and variances of cloud uh, computing, matchmaking, that, that will actually make Halo 5 a better game than it would have been had we done it in a vacuum. So there, there, it's mostly uh, something I've taken very personally uh, uh, as a, a sort of a 
big challenge in my career just in terms of communication and, and, and again, when you take it personally, you feel it personally. Um, but uh, Halo 5 won't, simply won't suffer the same uh, indignities because it's been developed very differently. Did you learn a lot from the beta and the minute to minute gameplay? I mean, is, is the feedback coming, has it changed it much? I think there's three reasons that you do a beta. Uh, the, one of the reasons to do a beta is a marketing tool. Get your game out, let people sample it, um, see if they like it. I think the other is that you have, uh, you, you just want to test some specific aspect of it, maybe just the networking layer or some last minute piece of the pie. Uh, we, we knew from some of the, the, the stumbles that we had with Halo 4, which, again, we're really proud of, but we, you know, we didn't do a beta. So a lot of things that we evolved and changed in multiplayer, some of them were successful and some of them fell flat, but we didn't, never had a beta process to actually test that stuff. Um, our networking code was pretty good, so that wasn't such a big deal, but there's all this stuff you can learn about that, that layer of technology. So when we started the, the planning for this beta, and it's, it's a huge amount of work, I think people often think, well, can you just cut out a piece and save as? Nope, you can't. You have to start up teams of literally hundreds of people to go build the beta, uh, to support the beta, to make the beta work online. So it's a huge endeavor, but we had to do it because we, we were making some significant changes to the way that the, the gameplay flowed. Um, and we need to make sure that those were functioning correctly. Uh, we need to make sure that our technology was gonna support it all correctly, but this time, and, and this is why our beta was so early, we also wanted to make sure that players got real feedback and, and feel invested in the end product. And so we got amazing data uh, in terms of business intelligence and, and hard sort of code data and networking performance and so on. But I think uh, the, the best data we got was uh, player, uh, player performance and expectation and we got huge amounts of feedback and we, we've already made significant changes based on that, including uh, Josh Holmes, our executive uh, producer, announced a couple of weeks ago that, for example, you will be able to uh, toggle sprint on and off. And like the beta, it's not as simple as that. I think people think it's a switch, but that means we have to rethink the way that some maps slow and so on and so on. So a huge amount of work. Um, and for a fairly small uh, segment of the player base, but kind of like the pro team, that, that small segment of the player base can be very, very uh, illuminating and informative for the rest of our game experience. How important is esports to the franchise and the studio? Um, esports, as uh, you know, I've heard it described variously as a trend and a fad and a movement. And, and to to us at Three Four Three, it's it's a foundational part of our history. Uh, the first Halo on Xbox. Uh, obviously it was built around the LAN scene and people getting together in ad hoc and properly organized tournaments and more casual social settings. So it's, it's built in our DNA anyway. And I think that eSports is a, a good codifying label for, for uh, any kind of competitive gameplay with, a, with an end goal. Um, that end goal might be a worldwide tournament, it might be a local derby. Um, and it, I think it's always been built in the way that Halo functions from Halo CE. Uh, onwards, but I think importantly, when we when we made Halo 2 in 2004, uh, what we tried to do was capture the feeling of a tournament and a LAN tournament and a Karate Kid tournament, uh, and put that in a game so that people felt this uh, sort of competitive drive and this competitive uh, undercurrent in in what was going on. And it's it's been there in every aspect of our game for the last 10, 12 years, from ranking systems to the way that matchmaking playlists work to the way that we give you. Uh, as many options to customize and, and make the game your own as possible. In terms of esports in general, I mean, what aspirations would you say that 343 had for Halo and beyond? I think for uh, for Halo 5, uh, esports is, uh, just in terms of the way the gameplay works, is very important. So we're looking at these incredibly balanced, uh, tense, you know, hair trigger experiences. You've seen that even today with two draws consecutively. Like it, it's, it's nerve wracking and it's nail biting. And we love that, that sort of, that balance. And some of that's just game design. Uh, the, I think that the interesting thing for us when we look at esports as a phenomenon and a growing phenomenon is that we have a responsibility and I think the ability to make the, the game more watchable. Um, and there's simple things like cameras, those make the game more watchable for e from an eSports perspective. But I think like football or like, uh, like hockey or baseball or cricket, you, want all, you also want to make it more entertaining to watch for an audience uh, without affecting the immersion that the players, the, the, the competitors are, are feeling. So that's a tricky balance, but it's one that we, we feel is a big responsibility. It's one that we can actually uh, take care of uh, in, in spectacular 
uh, AAA fashion. So we're excited about that, but the, you know, we've got a lot of work to do.